Hey guys and dolls, before we jump into this episode, a note about our content today. This is created for adult audiences only. We advise listener discretion as this conversation focuses on sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. Might be a lot to take in. So if you need a breather, take a break and come back later. This is your pain game podcast where we talk about the game of living in and with chronic pain and trauma, getting to the heart of how to heal. I am your host, Lindsay Soprano. On the show, I plan on discussing with doctors, chronic pain patients, holistic practitioners, loved ones, and anybody that is interested in having their voice heard in the chronic pain and trauma world that we live in. I'd like to talk today about childhood trauma, which will be a topic that will be brought up on this show, unfortunately, far more often than it should. And how it leads to lifelong challenges, to say the least, and issues with our relationships go forward, right? No matter what kind they are, with our family, our friends, ourselves, (laughs) our loved ones. When you live in a world that, a world of a lifetime of traumas, how can you possibly escape? It's already happened to you, right? So you can't escape what's already happened to you. It's not about what did you do. It's about what happened to you. Now, hey, there's a lot of things that we do in life that are not the best for our bods, right? So this doesn't necessarily give you and out of jail for free card because <laughs> you made some piss poor decisions that have led to some pretty decent chronic pain issues for your life. I mean, we are humans, but don't disregard our role in that, right? We need to make sure that we take some inventory. We're no good to ourselves when we don't own up to our weaknesses. Now, if when we're ca- talking about childhood trauma, yeah, something that happened to us when we were little girls or little boys, I don't consider that to be a weakness, right? But as we become adults in this world, we do still have to own how we handle things. So we're no good to ourselves if we don't own up to our weaknesses. We certainly can't blame our weaknesses on others big time. I mean, we're adults now. Um, so do the work, right? We're all humans. We make our bad decisions. And so if we own up to them in relation to our bods and our souls and our relationships, then we should be able to work in a more healthy direction to helping to soothe our little bodies and our souls from trauma that happened to us when we were at such a young age where we had no idea what was happening to us and how our little bodies and brains and hearts are processing horrible tragedies that happen to them when they're young. And like I mentioned... (laughs) taking a little inventory here and there in our lives. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. Once you finally get there, it feels really, really good. Not unlike the word no, which which you'll hear me talk about on the show all the time. Saying no is the most empowering thing. So when it comes down to how you handle your pain, whatever that may be, whether it's sexual, emotional, physical, all of the above, there is certainly no judgment passed from me on how you handle your pain management or how your family and friends manage their relationships with you because of your pain. And what it comes down to is how many people in our lives actually truly know what's happened to us? How many people do we have in our lives that we can have these intimate and vulnerable conversations with and be as brutally honest as we possibly can without it breaking the other person's soul as well? right? Because we've talked about putting our shit on other people and how that has been somewhat tumultuous in some of my relationships, some of which I've mentioned, you know, are no longer. And some of which I have found new friends and family and people to, to love and live with, right? So with loss comes gain. So when we're talking about childhood trauma, we're dealing with our dignity. We're dealing with how expensive our hearts are and how we lose them through so many decisions that we don't even understand, right? We don't, we, well, these things happen to us in our lives and we don't understand how significant those little teeny decisions that we make 
whether we're aware that we're making them or not. It's kind of a crapshoot. <laughs> but we need to circle back to our hearts and how we lose them and how we can get them back. And that's a journey that I've been on for some time um, and find myself in a place right now that's still scary, that I still cry about. And it's one of the, you know, gobs of reasons that I'm here. So my guest today has been through hell. And after we are done with this episode, and we've talked about this prior, like she and I could do our own podcast, <laughs> just separate from this, just on there's so much for her and I just to talk about. It's insane. Anyways, so she's gone through a ton of hells and I'm using plural on hells because she has, but this little hot body over here has been through enough. And I'm here today to be like, enough is enough. (laughs) Let this bitch live without pain. (laughs) Her stories are riddled with childhood trauma, sexual, emotional, and physical. And then a car accident that forever has modified like her pain and how to manage that day-to-day pain. And that started at the age of about 14 or so. And then, you know, all of that happens in her life, which she'll talk about. And then she gets married and has kids. She's got three of them. And with each child she went through in each pregnancy, she had different results in the pain department, right? 16 years of marriage, three kids. And she's been through like 17 plus dogs. She's a major massive, amazing rescuer. And we know that a lot of that has to do with safety and acceptance because we tend to be drawn to animals when we have been traumatized because aren't they just the most special little creatures on the planet? And I've got two dogs and they are, I mean, they lick my tears, right? So here we are. And I want to talk to her about her being number one. And also about her being her own advocate, which we're getting better at. Both of us are. We kind of have been shitty and sucky at it. (laughs) We're the first ones to, we're the first ones to, uh, to, to uh, own up to that. That's for sure. But one of the things that's so important is that we do have to focus on number one because we're not good to number two, number three, number four, number five, if we aren't taking care of ourselves first. Because in this world, we tend to protect those that have harmed us and or have abused us and or just simply don't understand or just don't give a crap. I mean, literally. Well, not here. I am not here to protect those that have harmed my guest. I am not here to protect anyone from people that have caused them harm. I am here to give any guest that's on this show that VIP voice, right? to roll out the red carpet for you. So I'd like to welcome Carrie Paulson. She's a lifelong friend of mine. And also uh, she is my ex-husband's sister. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just lucky because I got her in the divorce. Yes, ma'am. I win. (laughs) You are number one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Um, All right. So we've known each other. I mean, we really haven't been lifelong. It's been since we were like, what, 15 years old? Yep. Yeah, whatever our sophomore year was, and we're we're not going to say the year here no, at no. all. Absolutely, not even remotely. <laughs> long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah. yeah, and we we spent a lot of time in. I don't know. We got into a little bit of trouble. We were in a couple different social circles, so mm-hmm. I feel like I was in every social circle. Me too. And kind of like dabbled in a little bit of all of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because you were in drama, so was I. I was friends with like some geeks that were bullied, and they were like buddies of mine in certain classes. So yeah, yeah, it all balanced out. Yeah, um, <laughs> it all balanced itself yeah. out. So okay, so you are here today to talk about something, and thank you for being here to do this. You're here to talk about this topic of childhood trauma and how that is bridged to you are as a woman now, but who you were as a teenager and how you felt about yourself and decisions that you made based on some of the things that happened to you as a kid. And I mean, we all know that things, you know, come back to us as we get older and it sucks, man. Um, I bet are you cool chit chatting about what happened to you as a child? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the, the red carpet's being rolled out for you, babe. You're number one. So my first experience with sexual abuse, I was, I think, four or five, probably five, somewhere around there. I mean, you're so young. I don't quite remember. 
it was a neighbor. It was a girl, only a year older than me. And she would take me into their bonus room and pin me down. I don't remember like clothes coming off, but it was, you know, totally inappropriate and, you know, should not have been going on. And I didn't really have a choice. I didn't fully understand what was going on. Of course not. No. Yeah. And uh, just strange things that you, you never forget. Like, I don't think I'll ever forget the smell of her breath. It was just disgusting. I don't, I don't know. I'll never forget that. Yeah. Did it happen more than one time? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Many, many, many times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it, and it, it was at her house. Yes. Always in the bonus room. She would lock the door. Whoa. Whoa. This was a strange family. They lived right across the street from us and they were, they had like six kids. And I mean, I don't know where my mom and dad were. <laughs> oh, God. Well, like crap, how manipulative of her yeah. at such a young age to like bring you into another room and lock the door. Sure. I, you know, so you imagine now I think back, m- something must have been happening to her as well. Sure. Or Absolutely. did. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I mean, I, it must have just felt traumatic to you just for the fact that you are just now even talking about it. Obviously it was traumatic because yeah. we push things down. Yeah, we do. It's yeah. like, I, I never forgot about it, but it was, it was there, but it wasn't. It's right. so weird. I totally so, understand that. Yeah. The brain is. <laughs> it's a wacky place. And amazing, but also frustrating. I guess, you know, it does that to protect us, I guess. It does. It's like me with pain and actually, and you with pain too. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but you know, uh, it, with pain, you have to, you know, you got to get yourself through it and it sits in our bods and it sits, our, but our brain is what causes it, Yeah, which is what's nuts that we have the power to change some stuff. And I know that, I, hey, if I could change your body's pain and you could change mine with just our like blink of an eye, wouldn't that be great? Oh uh, Yeah. Yeah. But all of these traumas, in fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to um, a show down in Laguna Beach, which is in Southern California. And I had a flashback to something that had happened to me traumatic there. And I did, I had not even remembered it since like the, it happened. And all of a sudden my response to it, to my sweetie was completely unacceptable. It was as if I was with the other person where something had happened to me. Oh gosh. And it was so, yeah, it was weird. And I didn't know it was happening until the next day when I was reading one of our favorite books and I, I, it, the body keeps the score. And uh, it, I was reading this chapter in this book and it's like third time I've read this book like all of a sudden I had this flashback and it made complete sense, but it didn't make any sense to me at the time. Mm-hmm. The only thing I want to do is get the hell away. Yeah. And it was, it was scary for both of us. So anyways, I understand, you know, how trauma just kind of creeps up on you mm-hmm. unexpectedly. It's like, Whoa, where did that come from? Left field. Hello. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we've got this young girl who pins you down and is molesting you for, you know, uh, was it over a year span of time or was it, a year. A year. Two. Okay. Yeah. And then we moved when I was eight. Okay. Uh, you know, five minutes away. So we, I didn't ever see her again. Okay. Yeah. So and then it, it started again when I was like 12 or 13, somewhere around there, okay. um, a different person, a male. And that went on for, I would say like a year, year and a half. And how old was he? Three years older than me. Oh, geez. And then at 14, I had my first boyfriend and that's when that stopped. And, you know, I had a boyfriend and it's funny, not really funny, but after going to therapy a couple of times, I remembered when I was like 15, my boyfriend was older. He was a sweet, sweet guy, but it, we had a couple beers together as stupid teenagers do. Right. And I, became so incredible. I remember this like it was yesterday. We were sitting in Newport Beach and I was just sitting on his lap, just, I've never cried so hard in my life. And he kept saying, why are you crying? And I could never verbalize it. And I don't know if it was like, because that experience had stopped and I, I don't really know. Almost like maybe you were like mourning. Yeah. Oh, maybe that like there was, there's a comfort in, in trauma sometimes, uh-huh. right? Where and now, and, I, and that's so messed up. Right. But we, I mean, I watch, I mean, we all do. I'm, I'm just like addicted to watching true crime. I'm like, oh, who got mm-hmm. stabbed to death today? Let's watch that. It's very healthy. 
<laughs> and I'm like, why do I have nightmares? I don't know. This is such a surprise. Um, so, <laughs> but it is, you read these things about how, you know, or you watch these shows and read, you know, articles or what have you in the news about people that have been traumatized, but they don't leave these people that have kidnapped them or, or who are traumatizing them. It's just like, it's like battered wives, you know, mm-hmm. they stay because what are they going to do alone outside? It's like, they'd rather have that safety, even though you're so unsafe, uh-huh. you know? And so maybe that was part of it with you. I mean, maybe. maybe it was like, I'm mourning this relationship to a certain extent that yeah. now is over, yeah. even though how gross and disgusting and sad and traumatizing it was it, anything that ends is painful. Yeah. Even if it was good or bad or ugly, you know? Yeah. yeah that, or maybe it was, maybe I felt safe with him mm. and it was, I don't, I don't remember, but yeah, I just, just little points that stick out. Then at 16, I was in a car accident and screwed my back up. And I, it's almost like that gave the pain a place to live. And sure. I, I started with physical problems and had to quit sports that I played and then uh, joined drama and met you. So there you go. I'm so dramatic. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So, you know, it, the back stuff just kind of continued with that. And then, you know, I got pregnant at 29 and um, that complicated the back issues more uh, as pregnancy does for a lot of people. Mine just happened to be really severe. So I have three kids. Uh, it got worse every time and then compounded with mental illness, uh, which I had never really experienced in the past, besides maybe some normal anxiety here and there. So I finally, after years, which is a whole nother episode about finding a good psychiatrist, found an amazing one. And I was diagnosed with a uh, postpartum bipolar disorder, which is not an easy thing to diagnose. No, I had never even heard about it until uh, you told me about neither it. Neither had I. <laughs> like I'm, I had some friends, oh, do you have bipolar one or two? I'm like, I don't even know what you're asking me right now. <laughs> so I asked my doctor and she's like, no, it's this one. So that has been a godsend to have a psychiatrist that cares and, you know, figured out the right things to help me out that and therapy, you know? Yeah. So in reading books and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, I find reading and writing, I journal a lot. Yeah. It is helpful to write out stuff. You mentioned, you know, a place, the, the pain part, giving a place for the pain to live and from the car accident. Right. Yes. So, and, and I totally get that. Like with my body, I truly believe that a lot of the traumas and the things that have happened to me are sitting in my legs and in my feet. I believe it. And there is a doctor that had, it was a holistic practitioner actually, who had said that the reason that you're unable, that you're in so much pain in your legs and your feet is because you're unable to move forward. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, Damn it. Yeah. Like that is heavy because that means I have done absolutely no work on myself. And you know, all yep. I do is freaking work on myself and yes. I'm still a piece of work. Gosh. <laughs> I mean, aren't we all? I mean, we're all trying to grow and, you know, growing, growing pains hurt, man. Yeah. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about the postpartum bipolar? And did you have any of that, like, in relation to the depression that comes with bipolar and the, the, the ups and downs of all of that, you know, the manic and stuff? Did you find during your pregnancies that it got worse with each one? And do you think that any of the trauma as a child was also part of that as well? Uh, The mental illness aspect got better during pregnancy. Huh? Um, I I mean, I had to stay on one medication, but back to like the manic, I don't get manic and low. Like I don't have the, the, the ups and downs that are that high. I never have. I've had one experience where, I didn't sleep for four days. So I think like day two and a half, I was hallucinating. I don't know if that was a manic episode. Hmm. That was like six or seven years ago. And it was horrible. But that's, I know friends that have those all the time. And I'm like, I don't know how you function. That would be so hard. Shout out to the people that have that because that is so hard to deal with. That was not an easy weak, but some people have that a heck, the time. Of, a heck of a lot more yeah. often. So I'm really lucky in that aspect. Anxiety. 
I used to think this was how she sort of figured things out with me. I used to think when I had an anxiety attack, it, for me, it would last two or three days. And right. she's like, no, 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 no. That's an episode. You, an anxiety attack is like 20 minutes, an hour. I'm like, shoot, I could, I could, I wouldn't even need a medication for that. I can do 20 <laughs> minutes, 48 hours. Who are is these people really popping Xanax for 15 oh minutes? God. Dear Lord. <laughs> oh my God. No, that's okay if you have to, but I'm like, that would be heaven. God, I so, hear you. Yeah. So, you know, oh my gosh, I don't know. So finding the right cocktail of medicine, that was a huge part of the problem because I didn't have the right diagnosis. So, I mean, I remember one time I was on like nine things and none of them were working. I remember. And yeah. you were like, it was like I was pill crazy. after pill after yeah. pills. And, and I know with me, I mean, I had, there was a, a part of my life that I don't care to go back to a couple of years ago where I had doctors shoving drugs down my, my uh, mouth, my throat, whatever. And I felt like I was absolutely a crazy person. I don't remember some of parts of my life from during those spans of time. It was really, really scary Yeah, because they're messing with your noodle. I mean, mm -hmm. they are legitimately changing the chemistry of your brain on a dime. Yeah. And I'm tiny, like, you know, like I'm like the size of a postage stamp <laughs> <laughs> and they're like giving me 120 milligrams of ketamine on my first, my first oh, go. No. And no wonder I went on like down a K hole. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. but what's interesting about some of those um, uh, is that these quote unquote K-holes that you do go down actually brought me back to childhood trauma. Oh, wow. And so with you and pain medications, did you ever experience like any kind of flashbacks from that? Because I know you've talked about pushing it, pushing it back and knowing that it's always been sitting there. And maybe that has been part of your pain because I have heard over the past couple months, because you just, you quote unquote came out to me about this information like, I don't know, three or four months ago. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been sitting on it since you were a, a little baby, basically. When I was pregnant with Charlie, who is a girl, which four years ago, she's three and a half. That was when a lot of stuff about when I was a teenager started to come up and I, I could not push it down anymore. It wasn't possible for me to. And there wasn't an hour a day that, that went by. It's actually still that way right now that I don't think about it. And so I finally, it was so funny. My husband and I were eating at McDonald's together inside, which is like, I don't think we've ever done that. It was so weird anyways. And I told him, and I mean, I think that was probably the last thing in the world he was expecting me to tell him, but it definitely felt better after that. And he, I'm, I'm very lucky. He's beyond supportive and amazing. And then I told you, yeah, probably like four months ago. Yeah. Yeah. I damn near fell off my stool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the bar stool that we were yeah. at. Thank God we had. And a I had been trying to get, it's weird because it happened very organically with you and I. Yeah. But like 45 minutes before you said something that made me tell you, I started to tell you. And then I thought to myself, I can't do it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I thank you for trusting me with that information because I know that that's really hard to do. Yeah. I mean, like really hard to do. And I've been starting to do it almost more than I'd like to. I'm like, geez, I'm just vomiting information <laughs> on for these poor people. And at least I can do it on the podcast where I've, it's fairly structured and it's, it's focused and I can, you know, I have my solo episodes and then I have my guest episodes as well. And it's really, really awesome to have somebody that you trust that you can talk to. Oh, absolutely. Which circles back to the whole psychiatrist thing. Yeah. I, and I recently, for the first time, found a psychiatrist for me because I have debilitating anxiety, but I'd never seen one ever. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Psychologists all the time because uh -huh. I'm a chat. I'm a talk. I'm a walkie talkie, you yeah. know? Um, so I've never had problems really talking to a therapist, but I was like, oh, if I go to a psychiatrist, that means I'm crazy. No. Well, of course yeah. I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah. I mean, most days it's good. <laughs> anxiety is not good for anybody. It is but, such a yeah. terrible feeling. And and when you when I think back on things that happened to me as a little girl, I have anxi anxiety just builds. In fact, right now my chest is really heavy and mm -hmm. I just started to sweat. And it's automatically my body goes into the fight or flight and goes into safety mode. And oh my gosh, get out of here. Or, you know. And that's kind of how my body feels and I can never escape that. Right. And I think that comes from a lot of that. And I know you suffer with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So with, with your chronic pain, you believe that with it, not just from the car accident, but from all of the, the childbirth pregnancies, and then you add all the trauma, you're in pain. 
Oh, yeah. And I mean, that's another thing. There's so many things in my back that are issues. I don't even know all the words anymore, but (laughs) seriously. But the fibromyalgia I was diagnosed with like two years ago, and that makes perfect sense. And that was another thing that took forever to get diagnosed with because doctors won't listen to you. They just think you're an addict. And and it's a diagnosis that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Because when you're, you've got something, I'm like, if I have something that I can hold on to, then I can go after it. Yes, exactly. One of the things that was driving me crazy and actually still does is I have just like this bone pain. I cannot get diagnosed and it's not CRPS. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something else. I've been saying this to my mom and to my sweetie and my dad for like years, like we are missing something. And so I'm worried. And of course, now, now I'm anxiety worried girl. Yeah. And I don't go to WebMD. Don't do no, it, Lindsay. Don't, do, don't it. do it. And I do it anyway. And so now I've got like 17 different types of cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't Which do of course that. I don't sleep. So what am I doing? Right, I'm I know. going down the wormhole on all 75 yeah. of them. And I wake up and I'm like, honey, I just want to let know. you know I've got two <laughs> days to live. I know. <laughs> Let's live them like we're dying. Oh my God. I do that with the dog. Something happens and I Google it. I'm like, they're dead in an hour. <laughs> I go into more anxiety about my dog. Something happening to one of them than me. I'm like, oh, my finger's okay. I well, can go home from the ER. Well, that circles back <laughs> to what I said in the very beginning of the episode about how you are a massive rescuer. Yes. And uh, you do dogs. I rescue people. Uh-huh. I am a compulsive rescuer. And I, and it's costly and you understand it from the dog perspective because it's yeah. costly on uh, in, in every way, shape or form. Yeah, it's my job live. and I don't make any money. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, but we hold on to these little, our little pooches because they help us when we're going through those traumatic times or those sad times or anxiety or whatever, they sense it almost before you do. Oh Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's like, it's like what they tell you on an airplane, put your oxygen mask on first because you can't care for your child that can't breathe if you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And that's a great analogy for life. It is. It's hard to do. (laughs) Telling me, sister. It is really, really hard to put yourself first. And I suck at it. Yeah. I am the worst at it. I am always last. You're not lying. I know I'm not lying. (laughs) No, I'm not lying. <laughs> okay. So what have you done in relation to therapy? So you're, you're on medication to help you with the bipo- with the, mm-hmm. the postpartum bipolar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're pretty good. You're, you're basically just the THC CBD girl like I am. Yeah. Medication wise. Yes. CBD and THC. I, I used to go to therapy quite a bit twice a week and, and my husband and I did and, and changed a lot for the for the good in our marriage. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I have not been good about it lately. I will be honest. I did go to a new therapist and talk about the sexual assault and then I didn't go back. But, and she's wonderful, but I told her, I texted her afterward. I go, I'm not ready right now. And she does, uh, pardon me if I have the acronym wrong, EMDR. Is that what it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she recommended that and she does it as I know, I'm pretty sure not all therapists do it. Uh, so that's no, something. not all therapists do okay. it at all. So I am going to get back into that. I just wasn't ready, but well, I did get it out to her. Well, that, well that's huge. Of. And you told your husband and yeah. you spoke to your dad about it. And you spoke to me. I told, and- I told my dad, but not about all of it. Oh, okay. I okay. didn't, I don't think he can handle it. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that a lot of sharing trauma, especially when we're kids, because we think that we're in the wrong We think we did something wrong. It's just like even today, like when a woman or a young girl is raped, they blame themselves. Like I was wearing too short of a skirt or I had too much to drink or da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they, they put it on themselves. I put a lot of that stuff on myself too. And and I don't know why. I I don't know why I do. I just do. I take everything on that. It's, I did it wrong. If I had done it this way, then that wouldn't have happened. da, 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 da. And I do it on all facets of my life, my business, my relationships, my friendships, my, my dogs. I mean, it doesn't matter my body. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am at fault for no matter for anything that happens to me. It's horrible. Yeah. You know, anxiety ridden 393 reason. (laughs) Yeah. 393,000. Oh my God. And then religion came into the picture for me too. And I don't know if it did for you because I know you grew up Catholic, right? I went to Catholic school till third grade. Yeah. But so, you know, you that's guys weren't pretty, practicing yeah. Catholic, though. I mean, I was married to your brother, so I know that wasn't <laughs> happening. <laughs> no, not as like adults. Yeah. Uh, but when we stopped going to Catholic school, we had to go to CCC. 
ROTC, which is oh. like Catholic school classes. Yeah. Yes. So, and we went to church every Saturday, but my parents aren't like, they're not religious at all right now. Well, and then with church though, I mean, at least from my perspective, from a religious side of things, I didn't want to share anything that happened to me either. Oh, sure. Because and, religion. Yeah. And, it, and you, know. you know, like I said, we grew up, or like you said, I grew up Catholic and my dad just told me recently that he was molested by priests when he was a kid. Sounds about right. Yeah. And it's like, and I just have a bad taste in my mouth about religion in the church. Well, me too. And I have yeah. so many of my girlfriends that I grew up with in youth groups. So many of them had been molested by either their fathers or their, or a, a, a preacher or their youth group leader. And so they had these, these ties to these religious people and they were like, well, this is okay. Mm-hmm. My parents are dropping me off here. I guess it's, this is how it's supposed to go. No, sure. it's not. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. No, my, the, my dad told me the priest told the boys, the kid that were just wrestling. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I literally just barfed in my mouth a mm-hmm, little bit. Mm-hmm. I've, I'm like, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, and you know, with me, I mean, I, I dabbled in the religious part of it for pretty solidly for about two years where I was like gung ho. Uh-huh. And as an adult? Yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. I got rebaptized. I did not know this. Yeah. I just remembered this as I'm talking to you right now. And and it, it's I have troubles with it. Like yeah. the fact that I made that cognitive choice. And I know the reasons why, and we're not going to get into it right now, but I know the reasons why at that time. Uh-huh. And um, so much of it, well, actually I can, because it kind of circles back to this, but it was because I had just recently started to get in touch with some of that traumatic stuff and I started talking about it. So it makes the most sense that I would want to clean myself of all of that again. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. yeah. But it wasn't because I believed in this big God and all of that. It just, it was more ceremonial for me Mm -hmm. than it was me actually like now I'm, now I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior, (laughs) right? Cause I'm agnostic. I believe, I believe that there is a reason why we are here. I believe Mm -hmm. that there's a reason why we, we have friendships with the people that we have and people come and go in our lives and what we learn and what we take from the people and the experiences and the reason why we get the chills and the reason why we fall in love and the reason why we make love. I did, I, there would be no, like, why would we be doing this if there was no other reason? Totally agree. Right. But we don't know. So everybody that says they know, you know, fight me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you read Have faith all you want to, yeah. Godspeed, just don't shove it down my throat. If, right? you, if you read the book, A Dog's Purpose, <gasps> which I think every human being should. Absolutely. It is. I'm not even a reader and I've read that book four times. It's just the best, but it's so cool how the dogs come back and, and it makes you feel better about a dog. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you and I've got our, our boxes and boxes yes. of dogs on our mantles. Yes. <laughs> and stay with your dog while you're putting them down. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and do it in your backyard if you can. Yes. It is amazingly yes. different than the first time I had to put down a dog. So and <laughs> we're digressing. We are. It's 100%. Okay. I'm done. But <laughs> you're done. Put a fork in her. She's like, I'm done. I'm done with religion. I'm done with dying dogs. I'm mm-hmm. done with childhood trauma. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay, but I, I just, I, I want other people that are listening to our little jagged pill here, <laughs> yeah. um, our jagged little pill um, that, you know, it, it is okay to talk about what you want to, to those that, that you trust, because we will listen for crying out loud. You could call Carrie or I, you know, uh, yes, like you can. DM, DM me on pain game podcast on Instagram. And I will literally talk to you. Not a problem. Yes. And because it took a long time for me to be able to talk about the things that happened to me when I was a little girl and, you know, and, and same for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I came out of the closet a little bit earlier than you did. I mean, maybe by like a year, year and a half. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago. And so for me, and we're almost dead. (laughs) Yes, we are. We are almost dead. Thank you. Nice, nicely done. Mm -hmm. Nice tie back. (laughs) Yes, ma'am. So, I mean, and all of this trauma stuff, you know, it's hard on our families. It's hard on, and pain too, you know, it's hard on everybody that's around us. And it sucks, man. It just sucks. Yeah. And and I apologize to those people in my life. And I think I've done it on every episode. I think I've apologized for the fact that I put so much of my pain on other people. And I don't even know that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in the support from the family is important, but it's also draining on them, obviously. Like, yeah, I mean, it has to be. Uh, And then there's some family members in, in some people's family, I'm sure that offers no support or 
thinks you're making it up, especially when they can't figure out what's wrong with you and you know you're in pain, but you know, there is no diagnosis, which is sort of what I felt like for a long time. And it's like, no, this does make sense. This is what you're dealing with. So we, we've been talking about, you know, our family support and the people that are around us and how we, how we process traumas from our past and how they affect our futures. And, you know, there are things that I can kind of pull from here and there throughout my life, things that I did, decisions I made. I was super rebellious. Why was I? Well, circle back to Lindsay and the million things that happened to her when she was a little girl. And then she, I did stupid stuff too. And then it was just a slippery slope. Like it was just this never ending cycle that would continue to go on and on. And like, I had like a hamster and a turtle. My parents wouldn't even let me get a dog. Like, come on, like, give me a dog. Damn oh, it. Lord. I know. Right. And like with you, you've been so good with rescuing. And like we've talked about, I, I believe that it comes from a lot of people that have been traumatized as kids. In fact, my vet shared with me that a lot of his techs that work there a lot of the people that work in the veterinarian hospital come from abusive oh, families yes. or relationships and they go straight to work with animals. Yep. That's like half my friends because I've made so many close friends in dog rescue that I have, I would say most of my friends are in the veterinary field and all of them have stories like this. Every single one. Well, and did you, is, is there a time in your life that you can remember where you started wanting to rescue dogs? Yeah, it was when we moved away from that girl that was the first uh -huh. uh, abuser. And I didn't know why. I still didn't even know till like three hours ago, basically, that my, and my therapist one time asked me, what do you do? I, I'm in dog rescue. Oh, well, that makes sense. And I'm like, <laughs> it does? And she's like, yes. So I started doing that at like eight and then it just went on and on from there. And my family never shared that view with me. If a neighbor's dog was running loose, they could have cared less. That was not something that computed in my brain, No, but I just wanted to save them all. And I still do. Yeah. And that you still are glommed on to animals for sure, you know? And you know, the, 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 I mean, when it comes down to you being sexually and physically and emotionally abused as a child, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense now. Yeah, it does. And I trust it, dogs more than I trust people. Well, pfft. Duh. Yeah. I like them more too. <laughs> <laughs> Humans just ruin everything. You Don't know? you think so? Mm -hmm. I mean, my gosh. <laughs> mm. Well, and I know that a lot of this has, is hard for people to listen to, especially those that have gone through it or have somebody that they love. And it's hard to hear and it's hard to talk about, you know, and we have this history since we were little girls, not just friendship, but now we know more about each other through this process than we did before. And I'm, I'm super grateful that you have trusted me and that you've trusted listeners to even talk about it. And you're scratching the surface. Um, and as you deep, dig deeper, and as I do the same with myself, trying to become a better woman, trying to be a better sweetie, trying to be a better daughter, um, trying to be a better dog mom, mm -hmm. you know, we, and not protecting the people that have harmed us and abused us, but protecting ourselves instead. You know, yeah. Um, and choosing us as number one because we you have, have to. to. Yeah. You have to. We it, have to. We have to be our own advocate, not just in like our day to day living, but when it comes to our doctors and our pain. Yes. Whether and pain can be psychological pain, right? We're talking about trauma, guys. Yeah. And I know that I'm done with being manipulated. I'm done with being manipulated by doctors, practitioners, anybody that's basically tried to help me. Overall, has been manipulative, and. I'm not letting that happen anymore. And that was a huge step for me because for I, was just, I was just doing what the doctors were telling me to do. Like, eh, I'll, sure, I'll just do whatever you want me to. Mm -hmm. And my therapist right now, who's just an absolutely amazing man, he's my wise owl. And he um, has really pulled me out of that, that cycle. And it's not easy to do. But if you guys want to talk to me or Carrie about this, please, like I mentioned earlier, you can DM us through the pain game podcast. And I'll be sure to let her know if you're interested in talking to her about this, or you can talk to me as well. Um, I want us to be here as a place that's a safe spot for everybody. So thank you for being here with me today. Thank you um, so much for having me. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, the two of us could sit here and just, you know, shoot it all day long. We need but. to do it again for sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe with a little alcohol next time. Yeah, Who knows? like, yeah, like brunch. <laughs> brunch. Where Ooh. you eat a lot. Yeah, we eat a lot and mm -hmm. we have 
what is it? Mimosas for the entire day. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for listening, guys. You are exclusively invited to share this VIP pain journey with me together. Let's get to the heart of how to heal. Please follow the Pain Game Podcast wherever you digest your podcast content. We'll be there. Visit us at thepaingamepodcast.com and follow us on all the socials. Thanks for listening, my little VIPs. Catch you on the other side.